One of the most exciting things about the Occupy movement is that people are asking fundamental questions that haven't been asked in America in quite a long time. This is the beginning of the beginning. When people begin to ask fundamental questions again, it's important to have people involved who can give historical context to these questions. In his new book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, David Graeber asks the question, how is it that moral obligations between people come to be thought of as debts, and as a result end up obligations between people, between people come to be thought of as debts, and as a result end up justifying behavior that would otherwise seem utterly immoral? He then pursues this question through 5,000 years of human history. He's especially good at unraveling those assumptions that, quote, have become so much a part of our common sense that we find it hard to imagine any other possible arrangement. I've mentioned many times in this series that there's a politics of clear writing, of writing for a broad audience rather than for specialists using specialized language. Graeber's book on debt is an exemplary case in point. He deals with a very complicated history, the history of money and debt, in a straightforward, common sense way. You may disagree with his analysis or his conclusions, but you'll have no problem following his argument. And I must add, one follows this highly complex argument with pleasure to boot. This also has a politics, the politics of pleasure. I've been reading David Graeber's work for some time, but I knew I wanted to ask him to appear in this series when I recently read his account of the Art and Immaterial Labor Conference at the Tate Modern in 2008 and found it to be one of the clearest, most honest, and most hopeful things I've read in quite a while about the relation between art and politics. Near the end of that essay, he points to a contemporary dilemma the revolutionary future appears increasingly implausible to most of us, but neither can we simply get rid of it. Genuine knowledge of this future is impossible, but it is only from the perspective of this unknowable outside that any real knowledge of the present is possible. The future has become our dream time. I think he's going to expand on that tonight. Please welcome David Graeber. Um, thanks for giving away my punchline, too. <laughs> well, I'll figure out something new to say about it. I must say, it's, it's kind of thrilling for me to stand in this room, um, although also confusing, because actually um, I grew up there, um, right above here in the Penn South Co-ops. My apartment overlooked this movie theater. and um, I remember growing up in the early 60s, um, watching strange lights creep slowly across my ceiling when I couldn't sleep from some effect of the projectors. I think those things right there. So actually getting to see them going back there was really kind of thrilling. The other real memory I have of this room, um, again, from being very young, was I was going to see a movie here and, and watching, um, I guess I looked up at light shows a lot, um, watching the incredible beauty of this sort of shapes and curlicues that formed when cigarette smoke was struck by the projector light. Uh, an awesomely beautiful thing that I guess people of our younger generation never, will never get to see. Um, uh, it was right there. Yeah. Um, I remember it from when I was five or six. So, you know, it was very thrilling to be speaking here. All right. Um, I want to speak about the future. And... Um, I recently wrote an essay for The Baffler. And Baffler is one of these magazines that keeps appearing and reappearing, and it's, it's reappearing again in March. And they asked me to write a piece. And I thought, all right, I'm famous now. I guess one of the things you can do when you're famous is you can do all those things that you always really wanted to write about, but never could, uh, because no one would take you seriously, or they laughed at the very idea. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to expand on this notion of the future that I've talked about in the art and immaterial labor paper, um, but relate it to something that has been bothering me well, going back to that time when I, I used to stare at the smoke here in, in this room, um, when I was five or six, it didn't bother me yet, but, but um, at that time, 
we all had a very clear idea about what this time, 2012, was supposed to be like. Um, all of us growing up in the 60s, and I think this is true of people growing up in the 70s and 80s too, and we had a almost kind of list of things that we expected to happen. I remember really well, you know, calculating that I would be almost 40 years old in the year 2000, and of course by then we would be on Mars, um, and you know there would be anti gravity boots and flying cars and um, teleportation devices and warp drive and tractor beams and you know all that stuff. You know? um, and I really think it's one of the experiences of, of my generation and, and much of the ones after have been this experience of like incredible disappointment which we can't express because you know, when we think about it, everybody always says, oh, you mean all that Jetson stuff? Like, it was just a cartoon. Yeah, you sucker. I mean, you know, we were silly to have ever believed it. It was just something for kids. But actually, no. I mean, if you look at the time, like, you know, very reputable sources. You go to the museums, you go to like National Geographic, they would show maps of what the big space station and the Mars launch was going to be like. And, um, we had every reason to believe this. Um, and even more so, even more so, it's actually historically plausible to believe that this was the case because if you think about it, if you look at the early part of the 19th, uh, of the 20th century, or a period around 1900. If you're a kid growing up reading Jules Verne in 1900, you know there was a list of things that you expected to be invented by, say, 1950. Um, you know, there were submarines, there were rocket ships, airplanes, um, there were going to be radios and TVs and things like that. And, Sure enough, there were. I mean, pretty much, I mean, you know, they didn't get the time machine. There was a few that, that didn't happen. But, you know, for the most part, most of the things that they expected to have been created by the time you know, they were my age, 50, um, they got. So what happened? Because, you know, you have this whole generation where you have a similar list of science fiction inventions, which everybody expects they're going to have 50 years later. And, you know, maybe it's unrealistic to imagine we could have gotten all of them. But we didn't actually get any, <laughs> not a single one. I mean, you know, people talk about, well, you know, iPhones are a little bit like a Star Trek communicator. Not really. Um, we certainly don't have anything like tricorders, right? Um, I mean, even the stuff that seemed like they were about to emerge, like, you know, clones and cryogenics, they all kind of flopped and didn't really happen, you know? Um, and, and things that you would really imagine actually were technically possible had they pursued it. I mean, they, you know, if they could get to the moon by 1968, presumably they could have gotten to Mars if they'd really been trying. Or, or robotics. Um, you know, it's presumably not absolutely impossible to build a robot that could take your laundry down, wash it, and bring it back again. But, you know, this sort of research simply hasn't been done. Um, so I think that almost everyone has grown up with this sort of secret secret disappointment, but also a secret shame because they feel like idiots ever having really believed that they should have this to begin with. Um, so we can't talk about it. it I mean, occasionally you see on the internet like the flying cars issue, but it's almost a way to laugh at people. Oh yeah, you were promised flying cars. Um, now, it strikes me that I remember around 2000, like waiting for the reflections on this, um, all the people talking about uh, what, how, how are we imagining our place in history at the turn of the millennium? So I thought there'd be a lot of reflection on like, you know, what the world in 2000 was supposed to be like and what it's actually like. But there, I didn't see any. I mean, maybe there were a few I missed, but there really was not prominently displayed. Instead, you had people acting as if breathtaking new technologies were in fact emerging. The internet, I guess. But I mean, as I always say, if you um, you know take a science fiction fan of the 1950s and show them the internet, you know they would have been impressed. But then, if they found out that was like the best thing we'd actually managed to come up with, you know, what would their reaction likely to have been? But you know, like this thing is is it's basically you know it's fast and it's convenient, but it's basically a combination of a post office, a a mail order catalog, and a library. Oh, that's it. <laughs> and what about the computers you can talk to, the you know, robots you could think? And, um, so it strikes me that there's a kind of a cultural trauma, which, like all traumas, can't be directly expressed, but comes out in other ways. And one of the first thoughts I had about this when I was trying to formulate it was to think about um, 
simulation. That perhaps what we call the postmodern sensibility is really just a, you know, a series of reflections on this trauma that we can't express. Um, first occurred to me when I was watching some, I think it was one of the um, newer Star Wars movies, which were, of course, a great embarrassment um, as movies, but they did have very good special effects. And sitting watching one, thinking, you know, people watch those science fiction movies in the 50s, they had such cheesy special effects. I bet those guys would be really impressed if they like saw this, uh, you know, what kind of special effects we have nowadays. And then, of course, I realized, obviously, no, they wouldn't. They thought we'd actually be doing this stuff by now. It's 2011. You know? Um, you know, all we've done is come up with really incredibly sophisticated ways to simulate it. I saw a bell went off in my head. Ah, oh, simulation. Everything's simulation. History doesn't have a direction. Everything's ironic repetition. It's all you know, hyper-real simulation. Of course, you know, nobody would be saying that if we actually were on Mars. So you know, perhaps this entire discourse was really a way of talking about technological disappointment that we couldn't express directly because we felt embarrassed to have ever believed it to begin with. Um, and with this in mind, I started researching a little bit. And I discovered something very interesting, which was that the phrase postmodernism, of course, as we all know, was framed by Frederick Jameson. And, um, 1984, actually, I believe, um, he wrote the, the famous essay. And it was actually a reflection not on purely, what well, it was originally framed, it was in relation to technology, but not in the way that we ordinarily think. It was um, a reflection on what he imagined would be the emerging sort of ideological superstructure or cultural superstructure for a technological infrastructure that people thought was going to develop, but actually didn't. It was very interesting. Um, because at the time, you know, Ernst Mandel and the idea of the third wave technologies, there's the agricultural revolution, there's the industrial revolution, and now there's supposed to be the information revolution. The information revolution, when it was originally conceived, was actually going to be accompanied by new forms of energy, robotics, and essentially new technologies that would make work obsolete. And if you read people writing in the 60s, um, almost all radical thinkers had, kind of, had embraced this. Really, all Mandel was doing was taking what were popular expectations at the time and um, giving a or theoretical cast to it. If you said anybody from the situationist to the yippies, um, they were all saying pretty much the same thing. They're about to come out with robot factories. It's really about to happen. Work is going to disappear. Let the machines do all the work. We're going to enter a new civilization where we don't have to work. Um, now, what Jameson was saying is, all right, this is all going to happen. Robots are going to replace workers. We're all going to be sitting there you know, working at computers all day. Um, what is the appropriate you know, sort of cultural sensibility for this new workless reality? And he had various interesting comments about the political implications, you know, the futurist fascination with speed and energy and um, how that seemed to have revolutionary implications. Um, the, uh, it's about Marinetti's celebration of the machine gun and the motor car. These are still visible emblems, sculptural modes of energy, which give tangibility and figuration to the mode of energies of that early moment of modernization in ways which revolutionary communist artists of the 1930s also thought to be appropriate. Um, so he says, well, that's lost in the sort of cool surface of these um, new technologies. But it wasn't framed as it was later to be as simply information technology. It was assumed to come along with the robot factories that everybody was expecting. Of course, what happens? The robot factories don't materialize. Um, instead, and there were actually strikes in the early 70s. Um, it, there's some doc, it's a largely a forgotten history, but the Zero Work Group actually recorded some of this stuff. Um, there were people actually beginning to strike saying, we're sick of working, where are the robot factories? You know? <laughs> um, it's happened in Michigan, right? It was actually one of the reasons they started relocating the plants there and shutting them down, to find more docile labor force. Um, now, so in a way, you know, what happens? Um, they produce a sort of simulation of what was supposed to happen. They move the factories to places you know, in Mexico and Southeast Asia uh, where you have docile labor forces working to work actually on much lower technological, um, with a much lower technological infrastructure of production than often they had in Europe and America. Um, and so it seems as if the factories disappear, uh, but in fact, 
you know, you're using much more intensive labor than before. And somehow they manage to come up with a way where actually people end up working much more as a result. So the hours that the average person working is radically increasing. Um, so first question you know, I started asking myself is, well, how did that happen? There's something really critical. There was a break around 1971, right around that period, um, where people s seemed to reverse course or where there was this great expectation of the disappearance of work, which was then handled by simply relocating work and doing it on a lower, um, lower tech machines. Um, now, when, okay, I should frame this. Now, we don't know whether robot factories were in fact possible, right? We don't know whether they could have actually invented anti-gravity shoes or any of these technologies. So when you're dealing with something that might have happened, um, you kind of have to make a leap. And the usual way people have interpreted this phenomenon is simply to say, well, you know, people had an unrealistic idea of what happened. It must have been unrealistic. It didn't happen, right, um, of what would happen. So, so why did they get it into their heads that all of this stuff was going to happen? And you can talk about the U.S. and the Soviet Union as frontier societies and the space as the final frontier and all of competition between superpowers introducing this notion of you know, both sides trying to conquer the future to gain advantage over the other. Um, and sure, there's always myths at play, but that really doesn't say one thing or another um, about whether it was actually true, whether any of these technologies could have existed or not. So I'm going to take a leap and say, well, you know, just as science fiction technologies in 1900 actually did materialize, at least some of those science fiction technologies that people were expecting in the 60s, 50s and 60s actually could have materialized and for some reason didn't. Well, why is that? Now, if you look at it from that point of view, you find something really interesting. There actually were debates, really very explicit debates, right around that period, about whether technological change was a good thing or not. And you know, the obvious person to name here is Alvin Toffler, a uh, history of whom is, is quite fascinating. I mean, one of the fascinating things to me about Alvin Toffler is that he's always, he's a famous futurologist. He made up the phrase futurology. Um, before that, he was um, most famous for having done a Playboy interview of Anne Rand, um, which shows something about him, which is quite interesting, which is that he's not a radical thinker at all. Um, and he's somehow remembered as such. If you look at people's book collections, the same sort of people who have Timothy Leary and Alvin Toffler next to each other, as if they're kind of the same thing. But in fact, in a way, they're opposites. Um, he's a person who is essentially writing this incredibly reactionary book, um, arguing that basically all social problems are caused by the increasing pace of technological change. And he had this idea of accelerative thrust, that every, uh, not only is change happening um, continually, it's happening faster and faster. Um, so if you look at the you know, sort of number of academic articles that are published, it doubles every, I don't know, 25 years, I think since the 1650. Everything's growing at the sort of exponential rate. Um, you could say the same thing of the speed at which um, people could travel uh, for much of human history. It remained about the same. And then the 19th century starts growing very rapidly. And then it really does seem to increase geometrically uh, to the point where, if I'm not mistaken, at Toffler's time, it was roughly 25,000 miles per hour, which was reached by the crew of Apollo 10 in 1969, just year, one year before Toffler wrote the book in 1970. Um, so, you know, it seemed at that rate, it was completely reasonable to assume that, you know, we'd be on other, in other galaxies, you know, in a century or two. Um, the weird thing is that maximum was the maximum people have ever reached. It stopped exactly at the time he wrote that book. In fact, um, not only um, the top speed at which people can travel has not increased since, the top speed at which people ordinary, you know, commercial flight, um, that peaked, I think, in 71 with the Concorde, and that one's gone backwards, of course, because we don't have the Concorde anymore. Um, so right around the time of Toffler, the phenomena that he describes in a lot of dimensions just stops. This exponential increase comes to an end. And at exactly the moment where people like him, and of course, as we all know, Toffler ends up 
first he adopts the sort of Ernst Mandel, does a capitalist version of Ernest, Ernst Mandel's third wave argument, and then he becomes the guru to Newt Gingrich, sort of um, letting go his real political stripes. But um, you know, Toffler was really saying, well, this stuff is scary because it has unpredictable social effects. And you know, what's really going on in the 60s, all this unrest, um, he seems particularly suspicious uh, of feminism. So like a subtext of a lot of these futurologists that they don't quite want to admit. He, even though he wrote a lot of his stuff later with his wife, he's pretty distinct, uh, consistently anti-feminist in his perspective. And one of his big arguments in Future Shock is the entire idea of motherhood is going to go down the tubes. Um, all right. so. You have these guys saying, you know, our, our most basic sacred things, motherhood and apple pie, are threatened by increasing technology. Another guy, um, actually, which people don't talk about nearly so much, um, is our people, um, Gilder, this guy George Gilder, this fascinating figure I've become really interested in, um, who was... He did a kind of theological version of supply-side economics. He argued that the money, creating money through the Federal Reserve and giving it to entrepreneurs is actually a reproduction of the divine act of creating the world out of nothing. And that um, it's, Pat Robertson referred to it as the first truly divine theory of money creation. Um, and a lot of these right-wing thinkers are more interesting than we, we, we know. Um, but anyway, he was also a futurologist. He, but, but you know, he and Toffler were sort of, that was also Newt Gingrich's other guru during the 90s. Um, he, um, they both had this idea that technology needs to be shifted away from the sort of old materialist base. Um, the kind of thing, the celebration of the engines and machines and the Marinetti stuff that, that Jameson was talking about towards Technologies that are you know, more, less socially threatening. Um, so they thought information technology, medical technology, they framed it in the logic of the marketplace. This is more market amenable. But you know, there's also military technology, which was a big thing we shifted to around that time. And it seems to me that what's really going on here is, I mean, they came a little late in the game. The shift had already started happening in the 50s and 60s. At the pace of technological change, you see for much of the period of 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, it really slows down radically. People aren't noticing it because of all these things like the space program give people a sense that um, something very exciting is happening. But you know, the moment we got to the moon before the Russians, there seemed to be this sort of sense of, okay, we don't have to do that anymore. And it's right after that, there's this huge shift of emphasis um, away from that kind of technology and towards precisely medical information sort of things. So I would like to make three arguments. So this sort of takes the form of a thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Um, one is that there seems to be a profound shift since the 70s from investment in technologies associated with the possibility of alternative futures to technologies that furthered labor discipline and social control. Um, now, as we can see, these guys actually were thinking about it They're, uh, and talking about the sort of dangers of um, technological, you know, sort of uncontrolled technological development. On, um, they were, seemed to be very scared by the robot factory stuff. Um, and I think one argument you could make, um, somewhat surprisingly, you know, Marx has this elaborate argument that um, since value can only be extracted from human labor, the change in the organic composition of capitalism, mechanization, is going to create a declining rate of profit. I assume you all know the drill. Um, it seems to me that it's quite possible that Marx was right about this. What he was wrong about was that capitalists would do it anyway and continue to mechanize. It's, um, you know, a case could be made that starting in the late 60s, people kind of figured this out. Um, that increasing mechanization of industrial production was going to basically um, undo the possibilities of profit. And you know, it certainly explains what they did, which was move to much lower and labor intensive forms of production elsewhere. Um, at the same time, these guys are thinking about the socially disruptive effects of technology. Um, and it's quite interesting, too, to think about the fact the, well, would, would this have even happened earlier had it not been for the Cold War? And 
Of course, it's really hard for us to remember that in the 1950s, the Soviet Union was seen as this terrible technological threat. Um, I mean, remember that they had actually, you know, pe people who were making plans in the 50s still remembered the fact that in the 30s, when America was in depression, the Soviet Union was growing rather like China is now. Um, the fact that in the 40s, they produced all those giant tank armies. Um, in the 50s, they had the Sputnik. Uh, and so. You know, people actually felt that there was a um, genuine threat. Um, this is why people always make the, fam the famous argument that the um, lunar landing was uh, probably the greatest historical achievement of the Soviet Union, since the US would never have done it otherwise. But one of the things I find really interesting is you know, we're also used to thinking the Soviet Union as these great bureaucrats, a degree to which there was a sort of imaginative ferment that reached American consciousness, too, indirectly. Um, because you know, these, we think of these guys as, as great bureaucrats, but they were great bureaucrats who dreamed like incredible dreams, and they never stopped doing it. Um, most of those dreams turned out kind of disastrously, um, and a lot of them were idiotic. You know, like Stalin's famous hundred-story giant palace of the Soviets, the twenty-story statue of Lenin. Um, you know, a lot of them didn't get off the ground; they remained on the drawing pad. But they kept coming up with them. Um, one thing that really fascinated me is uh, when you talk to Russians about this, you know, even at the end of the Soviet Union, they had these mad schemes. They had this idea of um, spirulina, you know, seeding the oceans with edible seaweed to solve the world hunger problems. And they had the, um, the giant energy project, which nobody talks about in this country, where they were going to, like, shoot hundreds of solar-powered satellites into outer space to beam energy down to Earth to solve the world energy problem. That's why they built those big booster rockets that we're still using. But... Um, it was all for that. Um, so they always kept coming up with these crazy, gigantic ideas. Uh, and a lot of the golden age of science fiction you know, happened both in the Soviet Union and the US at the same time, drawing on ideas, a lot of which had you know, been developed in Russia over the years. Because one of the interesting things about this future I talked about is we all kind of know the technologies we're supposed to get. You know, if you think about Star Trek, there's tractor beams, there's like, you know, death rays, phasers is their version of it. Um, there's force fields. You know, we all know what there's in cloaking devices. There's a sort of panoply, and any 12-year-old sort of knows all the things that we're supposed to have 200 years from now. Just like any 12-year-old knows how you kill a vampire, right? Which is kind of amazing. I remember seeing a vampire movie with a bunch of people from Eastern Europe, and they were like trying to remember, oh, yeah, isn't there something about garlic? You know? And <laughs> I realized that you know, any eight-year-old child in America knows more about how you kill a vampire than people who are actually from Transylvania. <laughs> Completely thoroughly inculcated in this mythology. And I, but I wondered, you know, maybe the science fiction mythology we have is actually equally an Eastern European import, at least to a certain degree. Um, and you think about it, like the Federation and Star Trek, and it might, might be a great example of that. I mean, in a way, what is a federation? It's like extremely military, top-down, but incredibly idealistic. They have no apparent class divisions, but at the same time, they have no apparent representative democracy. Well, you know, it's the Soviet Union, right? I mean, it's just like the good Soviet Union that actually works, that we're all imagining as our future. Um, so we have this lingering image of the future, the sort of Soviet future that we no longer can acknowledge because nowadays we have to think of the Soviets only as these guys who, like, it didn't work, that nothing worked. Well, I mean, if nothing actually worked, they wouldn't have been there for 70 years. Um, so we just sort of erase that from our memory, but it kind of comes in this lingering science fiction forms. Um, all right, so the version is, as soon as we got that out of the way, these kind of grandiose bureaucrats um, making these crazy visions, um, we could get back to the market. So the line is that the technologies that did develop, the medical stuff, the information stuff, is more in line with um, market imperatives. Um, I think a better case could be made that you know, there are things that are much more in line with driving victory, you know, first achieving victory in the Cold War and general victory in the class war. They're almost all technologies that have been used to further social control. The information technologies, which you know, rather than freeing up from people, for freeing people up from work have like you know, redoubled the amount of work people have to do through various complicated ways, whether it's you know, work pl 
just-in-time production technologies to financialization, all these things made possible by computers. At the same time, you know, even though we've been pouring our research money into medicine, still don't have a cure for cancer, but we do have, you know, Ritalin and Zoloft and Prozac and all these things which basically make people not go completely insane despite the intense work regime they're now under. Um, so this is one possibility. Um, you know, in fact, I would argue that neoliberal capitalism, and one thing we can definitely say about it, is it's the one form of capitalism that systematically prioritizes political imperatives over economic ones. You know, given a choice between courses of action that'll just make capitalism seem like the only possible economic system and one that actually would be a viable long-term economic system, neoliberalism always goes for the first option, um, which you know, leads us to this peculiar situation we're at today where the whole thing seems to be falling apart, but the one victory they've achieved is that they've brought us to a situation where no one can imagine an alternative. So, you know, you can do that, and, you know, that's the paranoid approach, and it's not entirely un untrue, I think. But it can't explain the total phenomena. And this is my antithesis. Okay, so you could say that all this technological advancers, I mean, it's not like they stopped doing big projects. They've actually, in a way, big science is even bigger than it was in the 50s and 60s. But they've redirected it in completely different directions. Uh, however, all right, if the reason why we don't have robots that can, like, you know, take down my laundry is that 95% um, of all robotics research is fun funneled through the Pentagon, which is true, well, why don't we have Klaatu? You know, why do we have gigantic killer robots shooting death rays from their eyes? Because we don't have that either. So even, you know, the technologies that we were supposed to come up with that they were funding and that they were pushing for, you know, by 2012, still don't exist. So how do you explain that? And I think the only way to explain that is, is, is bureaucracy. And I have to do a short version of this, but um, Basically, what happened was not a marketization of, you know, we have this image of Silicon Valley, and there was a little of that. But for the most part, you know, technological advance was still being channeled through big, big money in various ways, big science, as they talk about. Um, what happened was there was a fusion of educational, corporate, and uh, government bureaucracies in such a way that they had this idea that marketizing bureaucracies or introducing competitiveness uh, meant everybody should spend most of their time selling each other things. And I don't have time to um, you know, do this in detail, but I think most of us who have any experience of academic life you know, know what's been going on. Um, I remember thinking about this with um, academic publishers because you end up having to do everything yourself, right? Or everything that isn't done yourself is outsourced. And you're like, what do these guys actually do with their time? I mean, they seem to do something. Um, they seem to be busy all the time, but they don't actually edit the book. They don't like make the pictures. They don't do the index. I mean, you know, they don't design the cover. What do they do? And you know, what they do is they sit around in offices and try to sell each other things. <laughs> they, you know, they have meetings, they sell proposals, and they go to you know conferences and try to sell things there. You know, all they do is try to sell things to other academics. Um, and it, this is increasingly true of everyone. I mean, it's true in like what I do, which is social theory, right? Um, where all we do is apply for grants and assess things and assess each other and write letters of recommendation. And there's this massive outpouring of paperwork which takes up more and more of your time. Um, there's other things. There's a privatization of research results that we could go into in great detail. But the interesting thing is that it all, I, I think Americans don't like to confront the fact that you know, we are an intensely bureaucratic society. And in particular, the form of capitalism that we have embraced is a peculiarly bureaucratic form. Um, I mean, Giovanni Origi made this point uh, to great effect. And that, that you know, the corporation was invented in colonialism and things like the East India Company. But the British actually got rid of that. After the South Sea bubble, they were very suspicious of corporations. And the period of the Industrial Revolution, the 19th century, the period of the really greatest technological advance and change were not periods of large corporations. They were periods of very small family firms combined with high finance. And you know, much of the first half of the 20th century was a battle between America and Germany to see which would replace of the British Empire as a sort of new hegemon, but both of them were embraced very bureaucratic forms of capitalism in contrast to the British form. Um, the corporation really comes out of both. Um, 
And corporations, you know, intrinsically bureaucratic organization, the first thing the Americans do when they take over is create a global bureaucracy with the UN, the Bretton Woods institutions, and so forth. Um, now, that bureaucratization, and that's the moment where technological change really slows down. And if you look at, like, you know, where did a lot of these discoveries actually come from in the UK? You know, they didn't come from large institutions. A lot of them came from things like rural vicars, you know. There was a sort of eccentrics of society. They, like, put them somewhere where they only had to do something once a week, and they would, like, study the insect life or, you know, work on their strange theories of whatever it might be. And, you know, 90% of them were completely crazy, but, you know, 10%, that's where the patents came out of. That's where discoveries largely came out of. And I realize there's a famous... Um, astrophysicist named Jonathan Katz wrote an essay called Don't Become a Scientist, um, where he sort of described what happens nowadays. You have to spend much of your time being someone's flunky. The, um, but even once one isn't, he says, you know, you're going to spend your time writing proposals rather than doing research. And because your proposals are judged by your competitors, you cannot follow your curiosity. You have to spend your time and efforts and talents anticipating and deflecting criticism rather than solving important scientific problems. It is proverbial that original ideas are the kiss of death for a proposal because they have not yet been proved to work. So I think, like, you know, there you go. That's why we don't have flying cars. <laughs> I mean, that's it. He just told you. Uh, um, you know, because if you want to actually, you know, come up with an unexpected breakthrough, what do you do? You, you, you get like a bunch of creative people, you give them whatever they want, whatever resources they need, and you leave them alone for a while and you come back and you know, most of them aren't going to come up with anything, but you know, one or two are going to come up with something you never would have imagined. If you want to make absolutely sure that innovative breakthroughs never happen, what you do is you say, okay, none of you guys get any resources at all unless you spend most of your time competing with one another to convince me that you already know what you're going to discover. <laughs> So there we go. Um, I think that problem solved. I could, I could go into greater detail, but all right, but there's a synthesis here. Um, in fact, we live in this profoundly bureaucratic society and we don't notice it, largely because bureaucratic practices and requirements have become so all pervasive, we, we don't even see them anymore. Um, we can't imagine doing things any other way. Um, and, and computers, you know, have played a key role in this. Um, John Stuart Mill has this famous line, of course, that you know never has a labor-saving device been invented that actually saved labor. Um, it always seems to increase it. And during the period where they came up with all the industrial technological, you know, labor-saving devices, everybody seemed to be turned into an industrial labor at least part of the time. Now that we've invented computers to like create the paperless office and get rid of paperwork, we all do paperwork all the time, every day. Somehow works that way. Um, but I keep thinking of those crazy Soviet projects as the last gasp of what is a rapidly disappearing mode of technology, um, which <coughs> in a way we were forgetting ever existed. Um, and I would call those poetic technologies. You know, uh, Lewis Mumford made the famous argument that most machines are really based well, the very first machines were made of people. That bureaucratic rational techniques, you know, for example, they used production line approaches to um, build the pyramids. Um, and that later, you know, they had almost no technology. I mean, the lever, they didn't have a wheel, they had a couple things, pulleys maybe. Um, and that, you know, complex technology takes social relations, uh, bureaucratic social relations, and simply internalizes them physically. Uh, so you have this sort of rational bureaucratic approach, both to physical reality, um, through mechanics, and to people. And for most of human history, it's basically used to realize somebody's imaginative crazy dream. This is what I call it, poetic technologies. And they might be horrible dreams. They usually are, actually. Um, somebody's megalomaniacal concept of um, pyramids, building railroads across continents, going to the moon, whatever it might be. Um, so that's what I would call a poetic technology, when you use sort of rational bureaucratic uh, approaches to realize some imaginative vision. Um, and, um, you know, the Soviet, like, let's launch hundreds and hundreds of solar-powered satellites and beam the energy down, you know, that kind of thing was like the sort of last gasp of, the techno uh, of poetic technologies. Their defeat has led to the dominance of a complete inversion. What we now have are what I would call uh, bureaucratic technologies, and the internet is a perfect example. But everybody says, well, we still have creativity, we have the internet, it's very creative. Um, you know, we still have technological unleashing of people's dreams. But yeah, but what's, what is it actually 
to do. Basically, you know, what happens is we have people using all sorts of creative energies and insights and innovation to create ever better platforms to fill out forms. <laughs> so imagination now exists in the service of bureaucracy, bureaucracy that, which thus encompasses every aspect of our lives. I mean, even right before I, you know, gave this talk, I got these, um, you know, uh, three different pieces of paper I have to sign and fill out in order to get paid. Now, I'm, I'm guessing that when Max Weber gave talks, you know, in Heidelberg in 1910, you know, he didn't actually have to fill out three forms. And those, they were Germans. I mean, they were supposed to be the worst, right? <laughs> He's like... Uh, somehow we, this has happened to us and we don't even notice it anymore, you know? Um, we spend more time filling out forms than any population in human history. I remember seeing somewhere that um, the average American spends six months of their life waiting for the light to change. I, I, how much of our lives we spend doing paperwork, I can't even imagine. It's like a really substantial chunk. Um, all right, so the question is what happens to the future under this peculiar circumstance? Um, because, and, and, you know, whereby, you know, we've got the situation where we're used to this idea of technology sort of uh, increasing, but it's basically hit a wall. And we can't admit to this fact. And what are the cultural consequences? And I think, you know, we've been spinning around and around with this in a million different ways, but we just don't know what to do with the future anymore. My friend Bifo... Franco Bifo Borardi wrote a book, um, The End of the Future, talking, about, it was written on the 100th anniversary of Marinetti's Futurist Manifesto, and he wrote a post-Futurist Manifesto. And um, oh, I, I basically saying, okay, the future is gone, we have to come up with something else now. But in a way, that, that very dilemma um, reveals something that we can't actually get over it, because you know, we still have this idea of being post-something, we're just running out of things to be post of. Um, you know, okay, we got rid of modernism, we got rid of structuralism, we're just going to try to come up with everything. So it's always like, I've got a new idea, I've got a new idea about why new ideas don't really happen anymore. Um, <laughs> there's this endless sort of cycle. Um, but in, it shows that there is a certain way that, that we can't get out of the rut. Um, and it strikes me this happens on two different levels. Um, it happens in capitalism. You know, there was a moment in the 90s when, you know, with the fall of the Soviet bloc, that capitalism thought, well, we can just take up that sort of revolutionary, redemptive future, future and just say we're doing it. And there's like this very brief moment that um, the New York Times was saying if Che Guevara were alive now, he'd be a neoliberal because just out of sheer revolutionary fervor because we're revolutionizing everything. And they sort of just tried to transpose it and readopt the sort of utopian revolutionary rhetoric on the capitalist side. It, it completely failed. Um, um, it fell apart in just a few years. Um, it doesn't work that way. Um, yet, I mean, the capitalists are stuck, I think, because they can't really imagine a redemptive capitalist future. Um, but they also can't imagine things staying the same, because our basic rhetoric of how we imagine ourselves is, base, is, is so deeply based on an idea of a redemptive future. We can't really tell our children that, you know, I don't know, the fact that slavery ended and women got the vote, or it was just a historical coincidence of no greater significance, and we're not actually heading anywhere. We're not more enlightened than we ever were. So we've got this notion of this, um, uh, there has to be some kind of historical thrust, an idea of, uh, that it's somehow tied to technological thrust, but we just don't know, we don't have an excuse for it anymore. We just don't know anything else. So, you know, throughout, throughout the 20th century, we've had generation after generation being brought up with this idea, you know, at first World War One, then you know World War Two, uh, rise of fascism, the Holocaust, um, nuclear bombs, whatever it might be, you know, disillusioning them, but then they teach the same thing to their kids, so it just happens over and over again. Um, and in particular, capitalism seems to have a dilemma because capitalism can't imagine its own eternity. Um, in a way, like there was that fusion between the notion of a redemptive future and the fall of capitalism, which oddly served both purposes. Um, and having lost it, they, they really don't know what to do. I'll tell you what I mean by this. Um, there seems to be a strange pattern that for most of the history of capitalism, capitalists can't imagine the system they're in really being along around more than a few generations in the future. Um, you know, for 
the ninth, most of the 19th century, and, and people have documented this. I mean, almost all the, even the avatars of capitalism say, well, it's really a great system, but unfortunately, it's doomed. Um, and usually the reason is revolution. I used to live in Chicago, and there's this incredibly beautiful street um, in northern Chicago where you have all these 19th century mansions. And someone explained to me that the reason why is it's on the road to the nearest army base. Because all of the late 19th century capitalists like, were so convinced that the revolution was going to happen any week, and they'd all be hanging from trees. So they sort of relocated to the place where they could most easily evacuate. Um, so capitalists lived with this idea that it was really not going to last for that long, for much of the history of capitalism. The moment you get to the point where it's no longer plausible, basically after World War II, it's kind of hard for these people to imagine they're all going to get killed um, or that the system is going to um, come to an end through some sort of grandiose revolution, what do we get? Nuclear war. So everybody thinks we're all going to die in a generation or two anyway. Um, the moment nuclear war no longer seems plausible, global warming. Um, so there's always something about to destroy us all. And it has been the case. You know, capitalism, capitalists have never really believed the system is going to be around forever. I'm not saying that nuclear war and global warming aren't real. You know? um, either they have this idea they're going to be taken out by something redemptive or some catastrophe is going to destroy the world entirely. But I, I've always wondered why that is. And I, the, the most plausible reason I came up with has to do with uh, speculation. That, you know, essentially money nowadays is credit. Um, I think people argue that 98% of dollars don't correspond to any economic value that exists now, but correspond to an economic value people imagine will exist in the future, um, which actually makes the whole idea of neoliberalism, where you're supposed to provide credit for everybody so everybody participates in the capitalist game. Um, it's a way of democratizing the system. You know, it becomes this strange system where freedom means being able to ha own a piece of your own, you know, sort of permanent exploitation. Um, but be this as it may, um, you know, the thing doesn't work if you have a universal horizon. I mean, because if most money is speculative, you know, what's to stop you from speculating infinitely, you know? Um, yeah, if, it, if it's going to be 500 years. So people were using that kind of rhetoric. You know, there was a brief period, right? Um, again, after the fall of the Soviet Union during the sort of revolutionary fervor, capitalism is great. Uh, capitalism is the new dynamic energy. You know, they were, people were starting to say things like, oh, capitalism has been around for 5,000 years, and it's going to be around for 5,000 years more. Um, but in fact, capitalists can't really think that. It's a useful thing to think for ideological purposes. But you know, if you have that horizon, what's to start people from speculating infinitely and destroying the system? Which is, of course, exactly what happened right? during that period. You get the birth of the bubble economy. Um, during this period of capitalist triumphalism, you, know, you get so much credit money, the whole thing collapses. So capitalism is stuck with their future. They can't imagine a future at all. Um, However, you know, the one thing they've been incredibly good at is preemptively heading off any sense of any other redemptive future. I mean, that's why I say neoliberalism is really about prioritizing, destroying any possibility of dreaming for, of a radically different system, um, even at the expense of destroying the system itself. And I could go into various reasons why I think that's what happened. Um, but I don't think this is the place to. Um, the point is that it did. Um, so. What's happened to the future? We can't imagine things without it. And as David Levi Strauss said in the introduction, um, we, you know, we can't live without the future because it's only from the perspective of the future that we have any sense of making sense of the present. Um, that kind of redemptive future never goes away. Um, certainly, we have nothing else to teach our children. So it becomes a kind of alternative dimension. And to some degree, now is the redemptive future. To some degree, everybody knows that's not the case. To some degree, it exists in this kind of virtual form, um, which is always thinking about the possibility of it becoming real. And we kind of reach it, sort of like the Australian dream time. Um, it's something that, you know, the dream time was something which was both the past that once did exist long ago and still exists simultaneously. We can enter into it in dreams. Um, we seem to have made the future into the same thing. It exists as another dimension of the present, which we can enter sometimes on the internet, for example. Um, and you know, both exist in another time and as another dimension of the present in, in, a, in a kind of permanent suspension. Now, the question is, are we stuck this way permanently? Strikes me that no. Um, I think that neoliberalism, ha you know, 
oddly enough, you know, when Mandel wrote his book, he was really t um, coined the phrase late capitalism, which sort of for many years seemed more and more of a joke. You know, As my old advisor, Marshall Solins, used to say, it seems to be dying a more and more beautiful death every year. Um, but, you know, suddenly that's turned around. Um, and you know, we're in this peculiar situation where we are so choked by bureaucracy that we don't actually see how the possibility of turning that sort of virtual reality which we surround ourselves with um, every moment into reality would actually work. But, um, I mean, one of the fascinating things, I have this conversation all the time, uh, you know, being both an anarchist and an anthropologist with people who um, are skeptical about the idea of radically transforming uh, modern society, and they always justify it technologically, actually. Um, everybody turns into a technological determinist when you throw radical ideas at them. And so, you know, as an anthropologist, I know perfectly well that, like, there's an endless variety of economic and political forms that have existed over human history, of very radically different ones. And when you start pointing that out to people, people say, oh, yeah, but I'm talking about something that actually worked. And so, well, there's this at work, there's that at work. And I said, yeah, 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 but like, you know, those guys were primitives, you know? I mean, like, we're talking about modern technological society. It's never going to work there. Um, you know, to which, of course, the reply is that, wait a minute, I thought that technology was supposed to increase our possibilities. You're saying that, like, you know, primitive people have lots of social and economic possibilities, and now that we have, like, you know, machines, we don't anymore? <laughs> Which is hard enough as an argument, but what, in order to really maintain that argument, that, you know, nothing else is possible, you have to argue not only that the particular current technology that we have now could never allow for, um, anything but one social system that would actually work. But any possible future technology. Now think about that. What's the chance of that? That's completely absurd. Um, so in a way, you know, in order to create this sort of suspension where we want to think about a future but we have to shuffle it away to somewhere to the corner, you have to kill off the possibility. You have to convince people that there is technological breakthroughs going on that kill off the possibility of really fundamental technological breakthroughs going on. And I think that's what bureaucracy has managed to achieve. But the idea of it's doing, it, doing so forever seems almost completely unlikely and impossible. Um, I mean, maybe we, at the worst we can like stifle things here in the U.S., um, but things are going to happen elsewhere sooner or later, and the whole thing is going to come tumbling down. So I think a future will appear. It's just not going to appear from where we thought it was going to. There, I will. I will end at that point. <laughs> quote unquote, better in technology that capitalism would be annihilated? I mean, you're like saying these two different things and I was a little... Um, what point did you get in? I got in at 7.13. <laughs> you were talking about Star Trek. Oh, okay, what I already, what I was talking about like in the late 60s, um, everyone was expecting the creation of robot factories. Um, and like all the radical theorists at the time were saying, oh, the machines are going to start doing all the work in about two or three years now. And it seems like um, a lot of people who actually were capitalists started taking this kind of thing seriously and freaking out about what was going to happen um, once like traditional manual labor disappears. I mean, whether. But what, but yeah. what about, sorry, not yeah. to cut you off, but just like what about like with Foxconn saying like, oh, we're going to fix the problem with all these suicides by laying off like thousands of people and replacing them with robots? And so then you have all these people who are not working. What I mean, about it? Yeah, so it wouldn't work in there. They <laughs> have the robots. The robots are, are, are happening. Yeah, they are and they're not. I mean, like, the fact is that the amount of actual labor, um, you know, and the technological labor on which, uh, the technological labor on which it is done has in a lot of ways shrank. I mean, there are a few areas where, you, you know, there's robotics um, being applied, but even, one of the fascinating things is is that the shift away from high tech uh, production when people move overseas is actually cumulatively means that production is actually being done on the whole, you know, on an ever lower level. I mean, at least according to a lot of estimations, and certainly that was true around that period. I guess what, I'm not, this is not answering my question. Like, what? Yeah. What are you 
nobody knew. I mean, and, and, and one can't predict. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I can't come up with a, a grandiose scenario of exactly what would have happened because we don't know which of those technologies would have happened. What we do know is that you, know, you can demonstrate exactly the point at which people started freaking out at the possibility. Um, this is why I talked about Alvin Toffler. Did you hear about that? Actually, um, <laughs> yeah, I can't repeat the whole. I can't repeat I mean, the whole paper. <laughs> rather than um, yeah. what what had happened or what could have happened, could we talk possibly about um, uh, organizing the possibilities of technology not through bureaucracy but through the kind of general assemblies that have emerged through OWS and previously in um, protests that you've been involved with? Some of the ones that you like detailed in direct action, the ethnography. How, for example, we could stop moving away from the existence or not of robot factories <laughs> and and kind of self-governing within spaces like SBA, where we find ourselves like surrounded by a kind of environment we don't recognize since we haven't built towards it. Um, mm -hmm. As you said about you know being handed three uh, forms yourself, and I recently <laughs> like gave a talk in another academic space, and tech broke down, and I was the one who had to manage it myself. The same way that you're saying, like you know, mm. there's more labor passed on to each of us. And, um, so I guess that's just a very uh, Windy question about why we're speaking in a Q and A right now, which seems, uh, um, you know, a very, very strange formal, yeah. form um, for, you know, when we're talking about anarchist organizing in some way too. Well, I, I wasn't, but I do usually. Yeah, I, I, um, I could do that now if you want me to. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's very interesting. I th there's a fascinating relation of anarchism in particular with technology, you know, on, on both sides. Um, you have people like Kropotkin representing a sort of actually very pro-technology side, um, you know, who had as a direct answer to the robot laundromat problem, you know, um, when people say, why are there dirty jobs? Uh, or who would do the dirty jobs, you know, in an egalitarian society, you're saying everybody has to be a coal miner, you know. That was Kropotkin's answer is like, well, if everybody had to do it, coal mining robots would be invented immediately. <laughs> um, so, you know, the only reason we don't have these technologies is uh, because rich people don't really need them and poor people, you know, because poor people exist. Um, you know, it's sort of parallel to the argument that you know they invented the um, they invented the steam engine and the, the Alexandria and nobody ever employed it during the Roman Empire because why bother if you have slaves? Um, so there is the argument that that um, you know certain types of technology or will only be developed um, if you have an egalitarian society. Um, I think in a larger sense, um, one thing about OWS, um, this fact that we're you know, so subsumed with bureaucracy is you know, a, a token of the sort of interlacedness of you know, financial capital, the fact that profits are coming more and more from the financial sector and not from manufacturing, means that they're deeply embedded in government and, 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 and bureaucracy ends up Suffusing everything. I mean, you know, the reason I have to fill out all these forms is because otherwise I can't get paid and taxed and so forth and so on. Um, and and you know, one thing that I think is a real problem we have: the, the invisibility of bureaucracy creates a situation whereby we don't discuss it as an issue. And in particular. The left doesn't. I mean, the right does. I mean, the right has a critique of bureaucracy. It's a really stupid critique of bureaucracy, but they've got one. And the left doesn't really have one at all. And I think that gives the right an enormous advantage in a lot of ways. Um, and one thing that I think that, you know, sort of general assembly, this idea of alt radically alt creating radically alternative spaces is it provides, like, the basis for actually coming up with one. Now, in terms of like what kind of technological change would come out of that in the long term, I, mean, I think it's significant that people are at least fantasizing uh, more and more about the imminent development of decentralized technologies again. Um, 3D printing is a great example. You know, I, all my friends in Africa are getting very excited. You know, about the idea that we're going to actually, you know, people are going to start being able to make, you know electric cars in their garage. Everybody will. You know, all you need is a printer um, and raw materials, which people already have there. Um, so I don't know if it's true. I have no idea. I hear mixed things about the actual plausibility of this happening. But that idea of these radically decentralized forms of actual production rather than just imaging um, happening to emerge right now strike me as telling in a certain way. Uh, so um, I guess. I enjoyed your talk, but I just wanted to point out sort of 
the main <laughs> argument, which is that um, it seems to me that sci-fi, which is in some ways like the image of the future, is itself changing. And mm -hmm. um, an analysis of like what has happened mired in the sci-fi of the turn of the century, 50s, you know, is going to miss the mark because as things change, sci-fi itself changes, and so the thing oh, absolutely, that wishes yeah. to be will change. And um, it seems to me that, I've always thought that the sci-fi can sort of be divided into two. There's a sort of progress of sci-fi, and there's a sort of like ideological rupture sci-fi where the mm -hmm. game is sort of like, oh, what's totally different? You know, the mm -hmm. holodeck, the transporter, the thing. And a lot of the criticisms that you made about sci-fi or, or, or bureau bureaucracy applied to technology is that we haven't got these things yet, right? Um, why don't we have flying cars yet? And I, pos I, I, I think part of the thing is that these things are hard. Sci-fi is hard. But it's not, it's not that like, sci-fi is hard. It's, hard. it's sci-fi because it is hard. That is to say, like, hardness constitutes what sci-fi is. Um, and so you can't, you, can't, <laughs> you can't say, why don't we have this thing that is really, really hard? Because you know, it, it is hard for a reason. It, it's it's sci-fi for a reason. The other point is that like, um, as sci-fi changes, the things that old sci-fi wanted, sort of old school sci-fi wanted, is sort of like a spatial kind of change. Like, why can't we teleport? Why can't we fly? You know. Um, whereas the stuff that sort of new sci-fi does, and you can sort of see this if you read like William Gibson's work from Neuromancer to current, <laughs> the new kind of sci-fi is in the realm of sort of ideological, organizational change, right? That doesn't manifest itself necessarily in the spatial world, but something happens in the realm of how you think or how you organize yourself, which is the segue to the other question, that is a difference, you know? We may not have flying cars, but we have iPhones. And I think part of the shift that happens... whoop de doo yeah, is, is, is flying, <laughs> iPhones are way more interesting than flying cars. I completely disagree with you. I, I absolutely, utterly disagree. I think well, that are, are, are making up these, like, utterly stupid toys that, like, you know, um, as, as somehow compensation, I just, but like, don't buy thing, that at all. Realm, <laughs> I think the field of play in which we operate <laughs> which technology operates has <laughs> changed from spatial to organizational and whatnot. And mm -hmm. so sci-fi is this change. And I think... Well, that's true, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. But it's true on two levels. I mean, it depends on what level of sci-fi, too. Um, it is... I mean, sci-fi was always a zone of social experiment. I mean, if you look at the 50s stuff, that was true. There wasn't as much of the dystopian stuff yet. Um, but... I don't think the change has been profound as people say. And I think it's always, you know, the, the idea of like massive technological change and massive social change being linked was always the case. And, uh, and one of the things I was arguing is that's what freaked people out. Um, in terms of, and, and, and you know, saying it's hard, well, yeah, but that's why I started by saying there were times in human history where, this, you know, precisely the things they were fantasizing about did come true. So what you have to ask is what changed? You know, why is it in the first half of the 20th century the relation between what people imagined, the imagined futures and, you know, what was realized and the second half just completely altered? Um, and you could... To you know, come to two conclusions. For some reason, they were just more realistic in their guesses in 1900 than they were in 1955. You know, um, or you could say actually something happened, um, and there is evidence that something happened. You, mean, you could see these people sort of freaking out about the social um, possibilities, and and they were, and again, um, that that spatial organizational uh, thing was exactly what they were talking about. If you look at you know what. People like Toffler and Gilder are worrying about uh, when they're talking about, you know, when they're trying to make up futurology and saying we need to control the pace of technological change so it doesn't disrupt um, society. That's it. You know, they're worrying about the family structure, they're worrying about organizational structures. And they're saying, you know, like these things are linked. One is going to destroy the other. We have to put a stop to this. And so, so what's so fascinating is that that we don't tell the story that way. But you know, it, we we sort of reimagined a lot of these guys as if they're really into the future, but they're not. Um, and and they're worrying about it specifically for social reasons. So uh, let me jump in here. I I don't think you're talking about sci-fi as sci-fi. I mean, I, what I imagine is that you're talking about this really geeky guy at NASA in 1950s, 60s something whose father packed up the truck in South Jersey because they were listening to War of the Worlds and saying, wow, we could really make that happen. That's really cool. So you're talking about having an imagination about the future and then having the means to make that happen, I think. 
I'm also talking about the way people are brought up. I mean, it was just commonplace assumption that like yeah. certain technologies were going to exist. And the thing is that kids but, but, still know those technologies. They just see them as like, you know, like Narnia or Middle Earth. I get it. But <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say that as a, a kind of reinforcement of the idea of imagination mm. and, and then say in 1989, when the wall came down, I was very sad, not because I cared about it, but because the other left mm -hmm. the picture. And I think one of the things that I haven't heard you talk about, although I love everything you said, is what we have been doing in the past 20 or 30 years, which is like a mashup between super colliders and queer theory. Mm -hmm. which has been internal, which has been an internal inspection of the things inside of what exists. So, you know, they're worried about the family, mm. but I probably scare them more than <laughs> the iPhone. So, it, what ha there has been a whole underground of people who are simultaneously living in bureaucracy, mm -hmm. um, who are working the underground, who are infiltrating those systems, and doing a whole lot of work that has has to do with capitalism only because it's the only thing that, that will allow us to survive at the, at the moment. But we're, uh, we're looking inside in order to gain a new kind of imagination of what's possible. And I don't really, when you say you can be queer in the world wherever you go and not worry about being killed, I would choose that mm -hmm. instead of a flying car. I don't have a car. Well, sure, I mean, we're not we're near there. <laughs> uh. Uh, oh my oh, response! Oh, um, I mean, I didn't. What was the question? Yeah. I mean, no. I, I, yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, and 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 you know, like saying that we're, we're the future becomes something that like becomes a matter of of introspection rather than um, you know this sort of expansive moment. Um, is it might be an interesting way to look at it. I mean, I think okay. Just, give an example. I um, mean, you know, when I talk about general assemblies and things like that, if we look at the history of that, in a way, there is an enormous amount of uh, political progress that's made w within social movements that, you know, I mean, if, you know, I talk to people like Starhawk, who's like, a, well, among other things, a feminist science fiction writer. But, you know, she says, like, you know, it's amazing to see since the 70s just how far people have gotten with this direct democracy stuff, which, like, people were really clumsy at at first. And, um, and uh, you know, there's been this extraordinary sort of advance. Um, I mean, it's ironic because it's you know we're advancing towards something that you know when I went to Madagascar, people knew how to do consensus process just fine. Everybody grew up with it. They've been doing it for a thousand years. You know, it's just the way you do things. Um, and in a way, you know, our advance is to get back there. But nonetheless, we're getting back there in a different way, in a very self-conscious way that could be applied to other sorts of problems. So I think that there has been, all, you know, I, I actually think that the rhetoric, it's not that we have destroyed any notion of progress, um, and I don't think we should abandon that. Um, in fact, we can't. Um, so that in the sort of official discourse, it gets thrown into other dimensions. Um, but I think actually, on uh, social and political levels, there has been like things that I would describe as like profound progress going on under people's noses that you know then suddenly seem to burst out, and people say, "Where the hell does that come from?" You know, exactly as in a dream time. Yeah, I had um, a very brief uh, question, I guess, starting with a very brief comment, which is that, like the Supreme Court, you talking about corporations being persons, you talked about capitalism as if it were a person. So that was interesting. No. <laughs> um, capitalism doesn't this or does this, but actually I don't know that you can personify capitalism. So that was my comment. And my question is maybe so basic that it doesn't actually make any difference, um, which is the way in which you, in this um, kind of marvelous uh, energetic um, formulation and folding of the, of the non-future into the non-future, um, what, what seemed to me to be not talked about is the notion of need or, or the constraints of need. And I'm just wondering how you think about the configuration of human need in relation to this sort of fantastical, progressive, technological um, projection 
that has either, it's very unclear from your talk whether you think it's failed, should fail, will fail, but... but what, what should fail? The, the <laughs> relation that we have as humans to technology. But I would love mm. to hear you talk a little bit about, about the way you, you think about or fold in the notion of, need. of, of necessity or need mm. in relation mm. to this bureaucratic uh, world. Yeah. Um, all right. First of all, the, the response to capitalism is I, no. I, I don't think of myself as, as seeing capitalism as a subject. Um, actually, I sometimes ask whether I should even be using the word capitalism rather than capital. I because I don't think it's a totalizing system. Uh, I do think that they're capitalists, and I do think that they meet and discuss things with each other more often than we realize. I mean, they have. Actually, they have advertised meetings where they meet and discuss things with each other. It's not a secret. Um, and. Uh, we used to besiege them regularly, um, Davos, and. Um, but it's not a conspiracy. What's a conspiracy? You know, people conspire all the time. We can go and conspire at the restaurant. What you know, <laughs> the problem with conspiracy theories isn't that people don't conspire. It's just like you know, it's not that conspiracies are always all that effective. And, you know, the problem with conspiracy theorists have is that they think they actually always work. <laughs> Most conspiracies are idiotic and don't work at all. Uh, but. And, and, you know, I, or if they do work, they don't ultimately have the long-term effects that, that, that people think. Um, hence, I think, so, 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 I mean, that's why I brought the examples of these concrete people that were actually making arguments. I mean, you know, like Alvin Toffler, you know, wrote some bestsellers and he spent the rest of his life doing consulting and doing special seminars for, you know, CEOs and corporate leaders of one sort or another. You know, like that's what he does for the last 30 years. So these guys do talk about this sort of thing. I mean, are, are they monolithic? No, I mean, but there is a sort of center of gravity and you can trace out, you know, there seems to be an emerging consensus among those people who are running things at certain points that you know certain things were scary. Um, now, in terms of need, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but I mean, one thing that I think is that you know, in terms of technology, the you know more egalitarian a society, the more the general direction of technological development is going to reflect actual needs. I mean, that was the Kropotkin idea. You know, like, um, we could eliminate, you know, a lot of the least pleasant things that people have to do if everybody had to do them. Um, I think that, you know, the more you have an incredible divide, the more technologies are going to be directed toward maintaining that divide, which is exactly what we have. And, I mean, um, one of the fascinating things I find is is the degree of securitization, uh, just in terms of like you know, how much uh, labor is sort of guard labor. I have an economist friend who's been working on this, and so estimates that twenty or thirty percent of all labor you know that's done in America is you know basically watching people from keeping them from rebelling in one way or another. Um, it's sort of similar to the people who argue that you know twenty. 10 or 20 percent of all work now is really compensation for the fact that people work too much. <laughs> so, so um, you know, all these jobs that wouldn't have to exist except everybody's working too many hours. You need all night pizza delivery men and you know, all the additional like medical and psychological costs of too much work, you know, actually produce a lot of the work which people are doing. So it's completely a vicious circle. Um, so this has nothing to do with human need. It has to do with the need of maintaining uh, a system of radical inequality, which it turns out is really, really expensive in terms of hours, which is you know precisely how you have this crazy situation where um, you know we're not actually the manufacturing sector shrinks and shrinks and shrinks we're importing more and more of what we consume yet somehow the actual amount of work that everybody does is increased pretty radically um, and it's essentially gone into this top heavy security labor um, sort of compensatory labor for for the effects of all that doing all that extra labor required by the security labor and so forth and so on has become this you know, crazy machine. And in a way, in that way, it's kind of not surprising that so many people have, you know, talked about the work machine and you get primitivists saying the entire thing just eats itself and you have to get rid of it. Um, my answer to that is that, well, obviously, aside from the obvious one of like, I'm not really into the idea of killing off 99% of the Earth's population so we can all go back to being hunter-gatherers, um, is, is that you know, that idea is also is based on an assumption or a strange faith, I would say, that not only are current technologies creating this insane um, 
cumulative of work effect, but that any technology that ever could exist will do that. And that seems to me there's no reason to assume that. Um, it's all an effect of the kind of pay, uh, direction technological um, change takes when you have increasing gap between rich and poor. Yeah, I wanted to uh, uh, first thank you very much for the talk and for your work on the ground and helping to stimulate many, many possibilities in people's imaginations. Um, mm -hmm. And on the topic of, uh, of poetic um, imaginations and imaginings, uh, first mm -hmm. I wanted to bring up, uh, I saw a talk by Neil Stevenson recently uh, where he talked about the responsibility of sci-fi writers and a group of them spinning off and making a very self-conscious decision through the hieroglyph process to reinvent techno-optimism. Uh, no mm -hmm. holocausts, no hackers, and no hyperspace. They, <laughs> they, uh, um, so this is a little playful, but to what extent do you blame the sci-fi authors for the dystopia that has uh, uh, we've befallen, and where did the Russians come up with it? But, um, <laughs> but a little more seriously, because you talked about redemption, I wanted to take up the question of affect, uh, especially in the context of optimism. And I think if you looked across the planet, you'd be hard-pressed to find any group, secular or religious, that is optimistic about the next 100 years for humanity. Uh, maybe I'll just end with, uh, are you optimistic for the next yeah. 100 years of humanity? Um, yeah, unless we, you know, just all die or something. Um, I mean, I, I actually do. I, I, I'm an inveterate optimist. I mean, you know, revolutionary kind of has to be an optimist. Uh, but, um, but I put it this way, uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about the death of capitalism at this point. I just really think that, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, it's it really uh, seen better days. It's kind of, you know, like, even like a lot of members of the ruling class and they talk to you privately, they're kind of like, okay, it had a good run. We're trying to figure out what the next thing is so we can take care of that, you know, get on top of that before it's too late. I mean, the rats are kind of leaving the sinking ship more than we actually know. Um, not all of them, they're true believers. Uh, but, but I mean, you know, in a way, I'm actually more worried that the next thing might be even worse. Um, so I think this is exactly the moment, like how could we have a stupider moment to tell people not to try to think of what a better system would be like? Which is of course the ideological line we're just being told constantly that it's just like we can't think outside that horizon. Um, you know, we are going to have another thing and if we don't come up with something better fast, you know, whatever they come up with will actually be worse. Um, on the other hand, I am an optimist, and so far as I think that, that you know, there's endless possibilities. I mean, I think this is a great moment for a reinvention of utopianism. The lesson I think we've learned about utopianism is not that utopianism is bad. It's that, you know, when you just have one utopia, it's bad. You know, what we need is lots and lots of utopias. Um, the more the merrier, uh, the more liberating it is. A 19th century liberal meant free market guy. Um, and the word was appropriated by, you know, the social democratic left in America so that the right wing had to choose another one. So they stole libertarian, which originally meant anarchist, uh, from the anarchists. Um, so, and then attacked liberals. So, which is why the system we now have in America is called neoliberalism everywhere in America, I mean, everywhere in the world except America, where the word makes no sense to people. Um, and as a result, on the other hand, it's telling that when you want to talk about neoliberalism in America, the only words you're allowed to use, you know, you can talk about freedom, free market, free enterprise, or free trade, you know. Um, you know, you can only refer to it with propaganda words. Um, yeah, in terms of, of like, I actually think that one of the nice things about movements like the Occupy movement is it at least gives us the opportunity to change the language and call things by their proper names. Um, uh, and, and I think across the board, the language that we use is, is so freighted that, and it's true even on the left, I mean, like think about the term human rights abuses. I was thinking about this the other day, you know. Um, if you want to go off, I can go off. Um, you know, human rights abuses. Um, you know, it sounds like, you know, not a propaganda word, obviously objectionable thing. Nobody can be for human rights abuses. But, you know, think of the following sentence. Um, it is sometimes necessary to support regimes of unsavory human rights records for, you know, to further our strategic interests. Or it is sometimes necessary to support regimes that practice rape, torture, and murder so as to further our strategic interests. You know, which is more convincing? Um, and, you know, if you take a basic measure, rape, torture, murder, which is what they're actually talking about, you know, when they say human rights abuses, and just apply that across the board, the world looks totally different. Until recently, for example, like, you know, the 
Somali pirates didn't actually rape, torture, or murder anybody. I mean, they started, some groups did now recently. But, you know, for a long time that was the case, whereas, you know, every government in the region does it all the time. Um, you know, so the, the, the good guys and the bad guys often get reversed. And, you know, through that abusive language, I'm Apo in Oaxaca, you know, they never raped, tortured, or murdered anybody, but they were the ones called violent, whereas the Mexican government, which did all three to them a lot, um, you know, was somehow going to be the good guys. So, um, you yeah, know, that... That refusal to use simple words to describe things has, has pernicious effects. I think in America, the one is bribery, um, the, the word that we're not allowed to use. Um, you know, basically what we've done is we've gotten rid of the corruption problem in America by making it legal. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's true on every level. I had a friend who was applying for a visa, and they had like a little box you could check to like, you know, for $25, they'd expedite your visa. <laughs> it's like, you shouldn't have to slip somebody on the sly. And it's like, here it is. Um, and, you know, so on every level, corruption has basically been legalized in America. So our entire political system is entirely based on bribery. I mean, you know, senators like uh, have to spend like at least a third of their time, sometimes two thirds soliciting bribes, basically. And, you know, the people who give them the bribes then write the legislation, which then, of course, gives them the right to take even more money from people. I mean, that's basically what our economy is based on. There's a huge system of circulating bribes. And I mean, in a way, that's, that's what people are pointing out, like um, when they're identifying Wall Street and the political control as political control as, as part of the problem. So I think, you know, starting to use words like that would be very helpful. Historically, um, airplanes and cars and washing machines and whatnot became fixtures of our life, I, not only because there were people with poetical visions of the future, but also because they attracted capitalism, which enabled, well, they attracted capital, which enabled them to be produced on a mass level and distributed. I certainly once in the not too distant past, robotics was considered a field that would attract significant amounts of venture capital. Uh, flying cars probably less so, but um, I wonder if you could comment on the extent to which you think the failure to produce more poetical technologies uh, reflects a failure or a breakdown of the system of allocating venture capital, um, and to what extent you think it reflects a lack of poetical innovation? Oh, well, I mean, venture capital, it, it attracted capital, but these things were deeply embedded in, um, in government and, and capital is always in bed with each other in very complicated ways. I mean, you look at the auto industry, for example. Um, you know, there's a famous line from Eisenhower, what's good for General Motors is good for America. And it's true that the auto industry is incredibly profitable at that time. But it's also true that, um, you know, the top tax rate on corporations uh, was 65% under Eisenhower. And the, I think, top rate on individuals, which is what CEOs would be paying, was 92% at one point, it went down to 90. Um, so, you know, um, there was this, however, the, what did the government do? It took that money and gave it to Robert Moses to build bridges and highways to, like, further the auto industry. Um, and, you know, in the process gave lots of, like, new jobs and politicians could get all sorts of bribes and kickbacks out of it. So the money cycled around in all sorts of uh, amazing ways, which seemed like virtuous circles at the time, which is what I think he was getting at. Um, you know, nowadays, like GM, insofar as it makes profits at all, it's entirely from the financial divi uh, division, which is, of course, why it went bust um, in 2008, because it wasn't, it wasn't making any money on the cars anyway at this point. Um, I think 15% at this point, something like that, of uh, the profits you know, handled by Wall Street, the great you know, center of venture capital, are in manufacturing at all. And even that's way overstated because they are counting GM's financial division as manufacturing. Uh, so there's been a profound shift. And, you know, um, whether it is something about a declining rate of profit and manufacturer owing to mechanization or whether it's some other reason is an interesting question. I was throwing out the possibility that Marx was right just because what he predicted sort of happened, except for the part about, you know, capitalists all competing anyway and mechanizing. Uh, Maybe it's something else. I don't know. Um, but, you know, what we can observe is this move away from that sort of interlocking of government and capital, you know, manufacturing capital in one form that we saw in the 50s, for example, um, and towards a system where essentially money creation is what it's all about. Um, you know, a government grants m 
well, they call it deregulation, you know, as if you're just allowing people to play the market. But of course, you know, what you're not supposed to know is that when people make you a loan, it's not like they add that money, they make it up by lending it to you. So what, you know, government is doing is extending to more and more corporations the right to make up money. Um, and that seems to be like where the profits are now coming out of and the financing of this stuff rather than the making of the stuff. Um, as I say, why that is, is an interesting question, but I think it has everything to do with the phenomena I, I was talking about. Um, are there any other um, social, uh, any other current or historical uh, societies that, um, besides the Soviet Union, that lean more towards the poetic technology? Well, I think all of them until just now. I mean, that's basically been the model, you know. Um, these poetic technologies have been, uh, you know, so I started with Mumford, you know, making that great point about the pyramids were built by production line techniques with no machinery. Well, so the social technologies come first, um, and gradually the industrial mechanical technologies often are inspired by what people are doing in coordination with one another. Um, at least that was his argument. And I think that's generally been the rule of any sort of large, any area where you have what we would now call capital, large concentrations of, of uh, organized workforce and um, resources directed towards a, um, some, some particular goal. There's you know, cathedral building. I mean, Keynes called it pyramid building. Um, that idea of channeling the surplus into something magnificent um, has always cropped up over and over and over again. Um, I think you know the, the reverse thing is actually new. I don't think it's going to last forever, but it's like a very strange moment where there's an inversion of what has been the historically predominant pattern. I just thought the Soviet Union was a sort of ridiculous apotheosis of this. I mean, none of those projects actually worked, but they just kept coming up with bigger and bigger ones and sort of marked the last possible step of, of you know, that grand historical trend that had been going on forever. Now, maybe what we have to do is get back to a way of doing crazy visions on a smaller scale. I mean, it seems like. I think we can leave it with that. I think we have to leave. Thanks, Dave. <laughs>